Well, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, my lovely students. It's time to delve a little bit more into Hinduism. And the title of this, this lecture is Brahminical Hinduism. Brahminical. What an interesting word, Brahminical. Well, if you take a look at that word and you boil it down to its root word, which is Brahma, that gives you a little tip off of where we're headed. And we only have one essential question in this lecture, and it has to do with the title. What exactly is meant by Brahminical Hinduism? <laughs> so that's what we're going to dive into uh, during this little presentation. Now this is the international stop sign for, for most parts of the world. This, this red circle with a white line through it. And I put it up here because I want to talk about what Hinduism is not. And it's somewhat foreign to Westerners because when we think of Christianity or Islam or, or Judaism, uh, they seem pretty absolute. Well, that's not the way it is with Hinduism and later with Buddhism. As a matter of fact, Hinduism does not have one scripture. If you ask a Hindu, what's your Bible? They're, they're going to they're gonna wheel a cart out of books <laughs> with a whole bunch of books there and say, here, here's my scripture. And oh, I might throw this one in on as well. So there's no one book you can point to. What's more, if, if you think about Christianity, you think of Jesus. If you think about Islam, you think about uh, Muhammad. If you think about Buddhism, you think of Siddhartha Gautama. There's no person like that in Hinduism. Hinduism's beginnings are incredibly murky. Uh, what's more is there's nothing like the Ten Commandments or the uh, Five Pillars of Islam or the uh, Four Noble Truths in Buddhism. There's nothing like that. There, there's no like set of guidelines. And as a matter of fact, Hindus would argue that they don't even have a monopoly on the truth. You can be more than just a Hindu if you're a Hindu. But there are some shared beliefs. And I like this image here. There is a path that all Hindus take. And it boils around the concept of dharma. You are required to do your duty. Karma, what you do in this life, both positive and negative, will have consequences. And finally, this idea that every, every soul on earth is going to uh, work out its karma. It might be through various lifetimes. Adolf Hitler is probably in a very negative uh, reincarnation right now, working out all the desp despicable acts he committed while he was Adolf Hitler. Every soul that is created is going to work out its dharma. It might take longer for some or shorter for others. And finally, there's this beautiful symbol, this, this beautiful Sanskrit uh, a symbol. Look over top of it. Oh. When you go to a yoga class, at the end, a lot of times they'll chant Om, which, you know, sometimes makes you feel kind of strange. But Om is this amazing sound. It's this haunting sound. And Hindus believe that if you were an exceptionally large creature and you put your ear down on all of creation, the collective sounds of all of creation would be Om. Okay, you know, uh, if you're a Christian, and many of you are, you probably heard something called the Trinity, the concept of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, Hindus are often accused by Christians and Muslims of being polytheistic. That's not true. Uh, granted, there are lots and lots of variations of the Hindu God, but they're just variations, very much like the Christian Trinity. So I'm going to talk about the three basic variations right now. This is Brahma, the creator god, riding his peacock. And notice he has four heads. He used to have five, but one of them got chopped off by another incarnation called Shiva, which those of you who will study Brahma can tell us all about. This is Vishnu, the preserver god. Uh, if you go back one, if you think of uh, Brahma as the god of the Old Testament, you could think of Vishnu as Jesus. Vishnu is the preserver God, and he comes to humans in all kinds of incarnations to help them um, carry out their dharma and achieve good karma. And he is the God of the Bhagavad Gita who convinces, 
who convinces, he, he comes in the form of Krishna and convinces Arjuna that he has to do his duty and fight. And finally, there's the reserved one, the, the dark one, the quiet one, the wild one. This is Shiva, the god of destruction, dancing once again on his dwarf with the flames around him. Now, this is an important concept. If you can ask, okay, so you have these three gods, uh, what's the big god? What's the main god? The closest thing a Hindu is going to say is something called Brahman Nirguna, which, as you can see, is formless. There, there, there's no, like, wild imagery about Brahman Nirguna. This is what you are unified with if you work out your karma in the last incarnation, last incarnation, and you you stop getting reborn. You become one with this God force. And it's not a personal God like in Christianity. This is an image that's often portrayed when Brahma Nirguna is spoken of. It's one drop of water landing into a large uh, pool. And sure, that drop of water, when it meets that pool, creates ripples. But it is essentially the same thing. Beautiful. Oh, one other thing about Brahma Nirguna is oftentimes uh, Hindus will say that, that Brahma Nirguna is Brahma without the negative characteristics. Uh, going back to why he had four heads and sometimes three and sometimes more, uh, one of his heads was removed by Shiva because uh, he was looking on his daughter with lust. Kripe. Now, one thing that's also very interesting about Hinduism and really hard for Westerners to grasp is this concept of theophany, which deals with the way gods and goddesses appear. And I love this image right here. This is Vishvarupa. This is, if you look at this thing, there are countless head, countless arms, countless legs, and this represents Vishnu coming to, uh, there's Arjuna, in the Bhagavad Gita and showing him all his different forms uh, and, and, and telling him, hey, don't worry, man, life's not a one-shot deal. Life is not a one-shot deal. And something else that's very important is this concept of an avatar. An avatar is a deliberate descent of a deity to earth. And what's taking place there is Hindu gods, by their very appearance, tell a story. And what you're supposed to do during this uh, uh, meeting up with this Hindu god is learn from their appearance what it is you have to do. So Hindu gods come in in all kinds of incredible forms, and those forms tell a story. Now, one thing that's very important is when the Aryans came to the subcontinent, they rigged the deck, so to speak. They made sure to keep this system uh, self-perpetuating because the Brahmins, the high class, the priests, were the ones that were the keeper of the scriptures. And somehow they were able to convince all of these warriors and very powerful, wealthy people in Indian society that they should be on top and that, and that those other groups should ascend or, 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 or their goal should be to ascend to be like them. Now that, that took some chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they carried this off is, is pretty incredible. Okay, I remember from the story of India video uh, when, uh, and I forget the host name right now, but when he went into the library in Calcutta uh, and they pulled out this very ancient scripture, it looked a lot like this. This is Sanskrit writing here, but you can take Hindu scriptures and you can break it into three basic types. There's the four foundational texts called the Vedas. And if you look at this picture, what you see is a, a Brahmin priest who is the keeper of the Veda. He's the only one who really understands what's in it. And it's been passed on through oral tradition from generation to generation, thousands of years. But now things get very interesting. Not only are there four Vedas, there's these two incredible epics. And the first one that we're going to talk about is called the Mahabharata. Now take a look, if you would, please, at the Mahabharata. It is a massive book. Uh, you can see this little uh, uh, <laughs> image here. The Ramayana, which I'm going to talk about later, is four times as large as that. 
it's four times, it's ten times larger than the Iliad and the Odyssey put together, and it's 15 times larger than the Bible. That is one long book. It was composed around 800 BCE. However, it was passed down orally for many generations before ever being written down. 1.8 million words in the Mahabharata. It is the, to the subcontinent what the Iliad was to the Greeks, an amazing story about a power struggle between two families, the Karavas and the Pandavas. The poet Vyasa is credited with composing the text. Now this is really cool. This is a little statue of the god Ganesh, or Ganesha. Uh, according to legend, if you look, he, is, he has his tusk in his right hand uh, because he's the one that wrote down the Mahabharata. And what happened was Vyasa was dictating this to him and uh, Ganesha was under the spell of the story didn't didn't get up out of the lotus position until the entire thing uh, was written down now there's a very small portion of the Mahabharata that's called the Bhagavad Gita and if you would take out your little paper and I'd like you to just take a second and read through it It's a very short read, and there are some questions on the back. There's three questions. And the first one is, what is Krishna's argument that it is impossible to kill or be killed? And does Krishna justify war in general or only explain Arjuna's duty to fight uh, this battle? And then finally it says, how does the image of Nataraja, that's the picture on the second page of Ganesh dancing on the dwarf, embody the ideas presented in the Bhagavad Gita. So I'd like you just to take a few minutes and look at that and then come up with some good ideas to that question. That's, being able to answer that, those questions is going to be really helpful in our Socratic circle and later in our test. Now in the meantime, I want you to watch this very brief trailer. Uh, this, is a, this is a story called Arjun, which is about Arjuna and the uh, Bhagavad Gita. And it seems like an Indian version of a Disney cartoon. So I think you'll get, you'll, you'll hear like the story of the Karavas, the Pandavas, and you'll see him going out on the uh, battlefield in his chariot. So sit back and enjoy. This is, this is intense. <laughs>
So if you focus on the task, the fear will take care of itself. That's pretty intense. Okay, very good, people. Now, uh, that was the Mahabharata. There's another uh, tremendous epic called the Ramayana. Now, I like to liken the Ramayana kind of to the story of uh, the Greek story of Persephone and the bringing back of, of Demeter and bringing back spring when she gets stuck under the ground with Hades. It's somewhat of a similar tale. This is a great image right here. This shows you the beast called Ravana. And this is Rama. Now, what's interesting about the uh, Ramayana is the story of devotion. The story is created by the sage uh, Valmiki and was believed to have been composed around 400 BCE. The story is about a god called Vishnu taking on human form to defeat Ravana. It's one of the most loved stories in India today. And uh, it's a story about a girl. <laughs> you know, Ravana captures uh, Rama's girl and he goes and saves her. And, um, but it, it's, kind of, it, it's a pretty uh, chauvinistic story in a lot of ways because once he goes and saves uh, his girl, uh, the beautiful Sita, uh, he asks her, did you let Ravana have his way with you? And she says, no, and Rama didn't believe her. Now that's a bunch of crap. So, uh, so but, but, but when they bring her back, you know, finally, you know, he, he, he believes her, you know, happy ending. But when he brings her back, that is when Hindus around the world celebrate. It's called Diwali. Now, I'm a big fan of The Office, and I have to show you this brief, quick, a brief clip about my favorite Office episode, which is about Diwali. And Dwight Schrute understands Diwali, and Michael, of course, doesn't. What is Diwali, you may ask? Well, I thought you said this was a costume party. Oh, no. What? Too spicy? No. These are disgusting. They're not s'mores, they're samosas. Do you think they have any s'mores? All they are is chocolate, graham cracker, and marshmallow. How difficult would that have been? It's hot in there. How's the nun? Dry. You should come dance with us. I have to watch our shoes so I don't get stolen. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm I, rejecting my what? kiss. I didn't. <sighs> A long game party. So have some for the Diwali. If you're Indian and you love to party, have a happy, 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 happy Diwali. Diwali, you may ask. Diwali is a celebration of the coronation of the god King Rama after his epic battle with Ravana, the demon king of Lanka. It symbolizes right. the battle between the people. All right, all right, this is the Lord of the Rings. Blah, 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 blah. It's so super fun, and it's going to be great. <laughs> a lot of gods with unpronounceable names. 20 minutes later, you find out that it's essentially a Hindu Halloween. Let me tell you something. Tonight has been one crazy... <laughs> love it, man. You know, Dwight knows so much more than Michael, but Michael's an idiot. I love Michael. What can I say? Just had to show you that. One of my favorite episodes of all time. Okay, one more thing I want to talk about Hindu scripture. There is another group of books called the Upanishads. And the Upanishads roughly translate, translates into Hindu knowledge books. The short dialogues where life's big questions are addressed and answered. These books are short and were composed over a long period of time by many sources. There is no set number because some look at certain works as sacred, others do not. But these books answer life's big questions. What happens when you die? <laughs> what is the purpose of life? And what is the soul? So those are the Upanishads. And I like this one right here. Who's, he who sees, this is a quote from an Upanishad, he who sees all beings in his own self and his own self and all being loses all fear. Beautiful. So these monkeys in India are, are incredibly annoying. And this wife, or a housewife, was looking out at one, and she just is like, you know, you damn monkey. But then she's looking at this monkey 
and she's looking at this monkey with compassion, like they're all the same thing. The monkey's just trying to, to live like she's trying to live. Hallelujah. Okay, people, that's Brahminical Hinduism.